the power series that uh, we're going to be on for the next three or four weeks is a series found in John chapter 12, 13, and 14. It's a series that's talking about how we can use power. Now, the word power we're using as influence. God gave us power. He gave us influence. So the mindset that we're talking about over the next few weeks is when you go to your home or when you walk into a room and you know because you're in that room, whether it's at your house with your children or whether it's in your school room or whether it's at the boardroom, whether it's in the workplace, wherever you walk in and you have influence, you have power, you have authority, what do you do with that authority? What do you do with that power? The last verse says, if you know these things and do them, you will be blessed. So this one chapter tells us what we should do when we have influence over others. Now, a lot of us, we can look at it, well, I don't have a lot of power. I don't have a lot of influence. When we look at our sphere of influence, we don't look at, well, he has a lot more influence than I have. We have to look at, what influence do I have? What power do I have? Is it my grandkids? Or is it my kids? Whether it's at school, whatever influence that you have, influence is power. And we have to take the power that God has given to us, use the Word of God, and try to communicate that to others. Uh, a few months ago, uh, our staff were going through some series, and this is one of the outlines that we went through, and so I thought it was pretty awesome. So a few months ago, I had the privilege of preaching in, uh, in Kansas City at uh, one of the pastor's meetings. So I, I used this sermon because I think that it's so important that we get the mindset that whoever is in authority, we cannot lift ourselves up to think we are someone that we're not. We have to understand all power is given by God to us, and it's on loan from God. If somebody gave us influence, gave us power, gave us authority, if somebody gave it to us, somebody could take it away from us. If you've ever been, I hope this doesn't happen here, but if you've ever been fired from a job, somebody gave you an opportunity, and they thought that they were going to give you that influence, give you that authority, and you did well for a while. But something happened that they took that authority or they took that power away from you. As easy as somebody can give it to you, somebody could take that away from you. And in our life, whatever authority, whatever power we have is given by God. Even when Jesus stood before uh, John the uh, Pilate, he said, you only have the authority my Father gives to you. When we look at the authority, our authority can come, and our authority can go, and the authority and the power comes from God. So whenever we want to say, how can I use my authority? If we want our authority or our power or our influence to be blessed by God, John chapter 13 gives us a wonderful illustration. He uses the illustration of washing feet. But that is not the purpose of John chapter 13. He says, what have I done to you? You don't even understand yet. It wasn't about the washing of the feet. It was the attitude of the authority with the servant. And when we look at what I do with that authority, what I do with my power, when we understand that, it is mind-boggling what God can do with our authority. In our nature, we think if I have power, if I have influence, I'm going to elevate myself. I'm going to use the power and the authority I have to gain more power, to gain more authority, to more people will look up to me. And that is opposite of what Christ says we need to do. Christ says, if I have given to you authority and power, bow. Bow. Serve those that are under you. And in doing so, you elevate them and elevate yourself. But if you use your power to knock people down, what you're doing is you're staying where you are or going down because you're knocking others down. Jesus illustrated this so well. They were going into the upper room. It was 24 hours before Jesus was going to be crucified. This was the last setting. This is the last time that he could sit and talk to his disciples. This was the last word of advice. 
They walk into the upper room, and every one of those 12 disciples walked into that upper room, and there was a wash basin there. Usually there's a servant at that wash basin. The servant at the wash basin was probably a 13, 14 year old boy or a little girl. It wasn't a man. It was the lowliest of the servants. Somebody that, it's the peon of all peon jobs. It is when you walk into a job and you have to like sweep floors for three weeks before they even give you something to do. That's the job. Nobody wanted that job. It was the lowest position. All you're doing is steeping down at somebody's nasty feet and washing their feet because they've been walking. But there was nobody there. So all 12 of these men walked right by it. They looked at it. They looked at their feet and said, I'm not going to wash my feet. If we don't have a servant, they're just going to put up with me. All 12 of them walked by. They knelt down at the food table with their dirty feet. And then they started arguing. So you know what? I think I'm the best one. I think of all of you guys, I think I, think I am the one that's closest to Christ. I think it's me. They tried to argue about who the best one was. So Jesus comes walking in. He overhears what they're saying in the upper room 24 hours before he's going to be crucified. And he hears them griping and complaining. And he hears them elevating themselves and trying to be arrogant in what they think that they are. He hears that for a little bit. The Bible says, and he knew that God gave to him everything and everything was in his hands. He knew that he came from God. He knew that he was going to go to God. And he had a passion and a love for these men. And he said, I'm going to do something. I want to give to them the last thought. And here it is. He gets up. He takes off his outer robe. He walks over to the wash basin. And he picks up the wash basin with a towel. And he kneels down to every one of his disciples. Even Judas. And he washes their feet. Peter says, what are you doing, Lord? And the Lord said, do you not call me Lord and Master? And, you, and I am. So I am the Lord. I am the most important person in the room. And Peter says, you're not going to wash my feet. And he just said, yes, Peter, permit me to wash your feet. You're saved. You're clean. On the out. I just need you to wash your feet. Because it's dirty. He became the lowliest of servants to 12 men. And he said this. He said, isn't the master greater than the servant? But when the master will serve the servant... It elevates the servant. And he said, go do this. He said, what I'm teaching you is I want you to learn that you have to serve. If you want power, if you want authority, you must always look at serving, loving, and helping those that are under us. The greatest example that we can give to our kids, to give to our grandkids, is not how powerful we are. It's how much of a servant we are. You go into counseling. And men ask this question all the time. I said, she just won't submit to me. She just, she has her own mind. She just does her own thing. She won't listen to me. <laughs> How can I get her to do that? You know, and it's easy to say counseling when somebody says she won't submit or she won't do something. And I say this. Love is a verb. It is not a word. It's not a noun. It's a verb. Love is action. So when you submit to her authority, submission, what happens is she looks at you in awe and submits because she knows love is an action. When we submit, when we honor those by loving them, by the example of washing feet that Jesus is doing, but he said this, he goes, you don't know what I'm doing. I'm teaching you that you have no excuse, zero excuse not to serve. You call me Lord. You call me Master. And that is so. And I am going to die in 24 hours to redeem mankind from their sin. I am the most important person, not in the room, not only in Jerusalem. I'm the most important person on the planet but I am going to humble myself and serve you. Whenever we serve 
those that God has put in our path. We can't serve everyone. But when God brought somebody into your life, somebody close to you, and they sense that you love them because you serve them, what happens is you elevate them. Early on in your life, if you are, have any leadership skills or any talent at all, and somebody would say, I see in you some talent, or I see some leadership in you, or I see that you, you have a gift in this area. What happens to a young budding soul when somebody gives to them a compliment, when somebody sees, I think you have talent, I think you can do this, automatically within their heart and their mind, and it goes, you know what? Somebody does see something in me, and it gives to them authority, and it gives to them hope. Because it gives to them service. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to lift you up. And when somebody with authority gives you servicehood, gives you love, gives you encouragement, what it does, it raises people up. And Jesus was telling his early church, 12 men that's going to start the church in 40 days. He said this, guys, more than anything else in the world, don't lift yourself up. Humble yourself. Even, even in the face of death, follow me. I am not here to take over. I'm here to surrender. I'm here to take care and do what the Father wants me to do. So here's the big idea. Be like Jesus by serving others. Jesus said to his disciples, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. In other words, it says, just be like me. Emulate my life. Do what I ask you to do. And here's the three things. Jesus washed the disciples' feet because he loved them. Because he loved them. Love is so important. How we love is so important. How we show our love. See, his disciples were not somebody that would be very lovely at this time. You know, we need to remember the disciples at the first, they say here that uh, one of them would betray him, one would deny him, nine of them would desert him, and only one would stay with him. But he loved them. The Bible says he loved them to the end. Even though Jesus knew what was going to take place in the next hour, he knew that these men that have walked with him for three days or three years absolutely loved him. So how do we serve out of love? Well, let me tell you where we don't serve out of. And when we serve and we feel this is how our motivation is, this is causes distress. The need to soothe feelings out of guilt. When we serve out of guilt, we never serve properly. If my motivation is out of guilt... We are not motivating properly. God never makes us serve him out of guilt. He motivates us. He communicates with us. But we have to serve God and serve others because we have a passion and a love for them. We have to serve our kids because of our love. Not out of guilt. Not because we can. Not because we snap our fingers at them. Not because they're going to have troubles. We need to tell them the positive things about serving God. And when we communicate what God can do, we love them. Not out of guilt, but out of love. Then sometimes we try to serve to earn God's favor. Well, if, if I do this, God will love me. If I don't do this, God will love me. And we have to remember as, as a follower of Christ, God loves you now. Unconditionally. Now, you can't do anything more for God to love you anymore. And you can't do anything less for God to love you any less. God is love. And as a child of his, he loves you unconditionally. He died on the cross for your sins. We do not have to serve him for him to love us. We serve him because we love him. And when we get that mindset, not out of guilt, not out to earn God's favor, and not out of praise of others, we serve God because we love God. Why do we worship? Because we love him. Why, why don't we worship? Well, because somebody may not like it. Somebody may say something or 
Maybe we don't like something that's going on. We worship because we love God. Period. It's not about what you like or what I like. It's too loud or too soft. Do I love God? And if I can't worship because I don't have a loving heart towards God, that's a condition of the soul that we must talk about. We don't love God for any other reason just because of what Christ has done for us. So Jesus washed the disciples' feet because he loved them. And then Jesus washed the disciples' feet because he focused on the needs of others. He focused on the needs of others. The ultimate need that Jesus Christ saw is they need to learn it's not about them. When he walked into that upper room and they were, they were talking about how great they are and who's going to be the greatest, Jesus said, said listen, guys, if he, if he, he just listen, the whole world is going to crumble under your feet. I need you to do something. I am here for a purpose, and that purpose is to die for your sins. There's a greater need than anything else, and I need you to follow my example and serve. We are not going to change the world or to redeem mankind if we think that we are better than them. As a pastor, what we must do is look at our souls and look at our people and look at our ministries and say, I need to love them. I need to motivate them. I need to encourage them, but the biggest thing that we must do is serve them. Serve them. We all serve in different ways. We all do certain things. But a service is just when somebody is in need and I can meet that need, I am not so proud that I will not do whatever it takes. There's a, sto there's a story by the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. Uh, Jim Simbola was the pastor, and, and uh, fresh wind, fresh fire. He, in that, there was a chapter. He talked about uh, a lady down in New York City that uh, came to church, and she gave her life to Christ, and she had a beautiful voice, and she walked up to Miss Simbola, which was the choir director, and she said, I would like to sing specials at your church. And Miss Simbola says, okay, we'll see what's going on. She came up about three months later. She came up, she sat in the front row, and she sat and she kept on asking, I'd like to sing, I'd like to sing, I'd like to sing, I'd like to sing. And she sat there and she started getting mad because all of a sudden, she couldn't sing. She, they wouldn't let her sing. And she had this arrogance about her and anger about her because she had this beautiful voice that she wanted everybody to hear how great of a voice that she had. So one day she came into the Simbola's office and she said, I want to know why you won't let me sing. I have a, I, honestly, I'm better than these people you have up here. And if you would let me sing, everybody would be blessed because I have a great voice. And here's what the symbolist said. They said, you will never stand on the platform and sing with a beautiful voice until you begin to have a beautiful heart. Until you are willing to do the mediocre, you will never have the prestigious. It changed her mindset. A few weeks later, during the week, they saw her in the bathrooms, cleaning the bathrooms and asking what she could do to serve. And then never complained and never asked to sing again. And then about a month after that, they asked her to sing a special. And when she sang that special, she did have a beautiful voice. But what came through is the beautiful heart. When we serve out of, I need to do the mundane I have to do the things that really doesn't uh, give it applause. But it's serving to love, to help, because I love God. I want to serve him. What happens is when we do serve, people see the transparent heart. And that's when people will follow. That's when we give our heart away. And the scripture that we used last week in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for the, his own interests, but also the interests of others. When we do that, we have a wonderful, wonderful heart that we can honor God. See, there's a parallel between the two. And the parallel, the contrast between Jesus and Judas. The contrast. Jesus, the master, washed the sinner's feet. But here's what happens in John chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. Judas sought personal advancement in the expense of others. Judas sought personal advancement at the expense of others. In John chapter 12, verses 4 and 6, it says, 
But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why would this fragrant of oil not be sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This, he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used it to take what was put in it. Jesus knew that. Jesus knew he was washing the disciples' feet that was a thief that's been stealing from him and that was going to betray him. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 14 through 16, then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, they sought the opportunity to betray him. The man that's going to betray the Lord, his character flaw was it was all about him. It was about what he can get. When we have the opportunity and the power and the authority that God has given to us, we can't think, what am I getting? We have to say, what does God want me to do? How can I serve and how can I love and how can I make this thing happen? And the last one I think is really good. Jesus washed his disciples' feet because he understood that true greatness comes from serving others. True greatness comes from serving others. At this point in this outline, when I was talking to the pastors, I was just open with them and I would be open with you. There's a time when all of our lives, whatever career you have, that career is going to be over. There's going to be a day that I stand before you as your pastor and I'm going to resign as your pastor. There's going to be a day that a new pastor is going to come in. And it's going to be fresh and it's going to be new because it's a new pastor. But every one of us, in our sphere of influence, in our power, our power, our influence was given to us by God. But one day, one day, whatever day that will be, our age, our abilities are going to take us off that scene. And what we have done in that sphere of influence over that amount of time is going to be what we can do, what we have done. It's not going to last forever. Leadership is stewardship. When God gave to us that power and that authority and that stewardship, it was given to us on loan. Our abilities were given to us on loan. Maybe we're young and we're strong and we're vibrant, but anything anybody knows, it seems like it was just... Five, five years ago that I was 30 years old, but now all of a sudden I'm 65 years of age, and I'm looking back, and where'd all that time go? What happened? It seemed like I just blinked, and I, I just started the job, and now I'm getting ready to retire that job. Everything that we do is like a vapor here today, and it's gone. What do we do in those years that God has given to you the ability to impact people's lives? You have a little child, a little baby, and he grows up. Now, you are the most important person in the room to that child. What do you do with that child? Oh, man, I got to go to soccer practice. Oh, he's got another game. I got to go. If it becomes a drudgery, we are not teaching them servanthood. When we say, I get to see you. I get to mold you. I get to love you. When we look at the most important person in the room and we can look at them, whether it's our parents or whether it's your parents or maybe grandparents or maybe it was a coach or maybe it was a teacher, somebody that when you walked in, they elevated you up, they served you. And when you look back at your life, the most important person in the room in your life, I guarantee you, it was somebody that motivated you, somebody that inspired you. Somebody that said, you can do something because we want to be that person. That when somebody looks back at our life over our sphere of influence in our 30 years or 40 years, we want them to know that we served them. We didn't motivate them out of guilt. We didn't guilt them to do anything. We looked deep within their soul and we took off our outer garment and we washed their feet and we elevated them, we served them, and we released them. Power is very temporary. Influence is very fleeting. You can have influence in somebody's life. That influence can be gone tomorrow. 
We can say something or we could do something that we could hurt and they could be gone. When we look at the influence that we have, the power that we have, if we always look at serving, loving, encouraging. Now, sometimes it's very difficult. Sometimes servanthood doesn't always mean that you're Mr. Nice Guy. Sometimes there has to be that hard love. Sometimes there has to be that discipline. The most important person in the room understands it's not always a pat on the back. Sometimes it's a kick in the britches, right? Because discipline, love, is very difficult. But we have to be prepared as we are the most important person in the room to look at the people that are around us. That God has given to us as a sphere of influence. And say, if I am their most important person in the room, what do they see in me? Jesus said, you said, I am your Lord and Master. And rightly so, because I am. They positioned him as the most important person in the room. He acknowledged he was the most important person in the room. There was no doubt that Jesus was the Messiah. They knew Jesus was the Messiah. Your children, your sphere of influence, know that you're the most important person in the room. You know you're the most important person in the room. You can. I mean, back in the day when you used to have, you have to change the channels on the TVs. Do you remember those? I was the remote control. Somebody give me an amen. You used to be the remote control. Get your butt up there and change that and put on that channel 12. I, my dad would yell at me all the time. Change it, change it. So I moved those rabbit ears. I had to do that. My dad, I loved him. I mean, praise God for him. But he said, go do that. You know what? I didn't have a say in the matter, did I? I, if he said go change it, I got up and changed it. If he said go get me whatever out of the fridge, well, you can put your own imagination in there. I went in there and got whatever he wanted out of the fridge. Because I was, he was the most important person in the room. My job was to serve him. Now, here's the deal. What would it have been like if my dad, the most important person in the room in my life, would have served me? Now, I respect my dad because he was, he was a mentor of mine and, and I love him. But I did not model his life because he did not know you are supposed to be a servant. He saw what his parents did. What I'm trying to communicate is what Jesus did. He said this, if you are the most important person in the room, serve. And you know what's going to happen when you serve your kids and when you serve your wife and you serve your employees? When you humble them, when you humbly go before them, they're going to elevate you up. They're going to teach you. They're going to love you. And they're going to honor you. Jesus was the most important person in the room. When Jesus died on the cross, he was the most elevated person that God has ever established. And above every other name is the name of Christ. When somebody looks back at your life, and they give a eulogy of you. It's not going to be they have a lot of money. It's not going to be they went to church. When somebody gives a eulogy in your life, the greatest eulogy that you could ever have is, He loved me. He served me. He cared about me. He motivated me. And when you do these things, you will be blessed. Not necessarily blessed from God, but blessed by others. By others acknowledging that your love for them is so obvious. Just service. Just washing somebody's feet. It's just lifting them up. When somebody that's in your sphere of influence is hurting and they need something, go into that room knowing you're the most important person in that room. Knowing they look up to you, knowing that you could change their life, knowing that you could discipline them, knowing that you could ignore them. You have all authority to do whatever you want. But when you walk in that room, when the eyes of the room go straight to you, whether it's your kids, whether it's your parents, whether it's a classroom or a boardroom, when somebody needs something and the eyes go to you, what do you do? When we elevate and encourage, we lift the potential of the room off the charts. You can elevate. 
or you can suppress. We need our children. We need our church to do one thing, to serve. We have a sphere of influence like no other. And how we change the outcome of people's destinies and people's lives by not being so arrogant and saying, I don't want to do that. What Jesus is telling his disciples, you have no excuse. I am going to leave you in 24 hours. You have no excuse. Your job is to serve. I served you and I am greater than you. I served you. You serve others. And that is the last words of advice from Christ to his church. Serve. Serve. I think churches have lost that mindset. I think parents have lost that mindset. I think employers have lost that mindset. I think people with sphere of influence in our culture today has changed it from me, 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 me. And it needs to be you, you, you. Oh, you can't serve everybody. But when God has uniquely put into your life a sphere of influence, two, three, four kids, maybe you're taking care of your parents now, maybe you're a school teacher or a Sunday school teacher, maybe you work in the nursery, maybe you sing in the choir, whatever it is that God has laid in front of you, souls and lives, when they look at you, here's what you want them to see. You want them to see a smile on your face because you get to be with them. And if they see a smile on your face and you get down to serve them like you're washing their feet just by serving them, what happens? A smile comes upon their face because somebody that they respect and love, they're trying to be just like Christ. The things that you've seen me do, you do. Be like Mike. Be like Jesus. And we do that, God can do great things. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And we, we need your help. And Lord, I tell you that sometimes our hearts, we are so fearful of servanthood. Because we really don't know what to do. So Lord, I pray that you'll give to us the wisdom. I pray that you'll give to us understanding of how we can just be the most important person in the room. Not with arrogance, but with humility. Lord, give to us the opportunity when somebody stands before us or when somebody comes into our sphere of influence that we look at ways not to be over them, but to love them. Lord, allow us the insight. Allow us that defining time within our hearts and our minds to understand what you want us to do and how you want us to serve, how you want us to love. Let it come across out of pure heart that we absolutely want to honor you because you honored us. You were the most important person in the room. Allow us to emulate that by serving those that are around us. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.